With the rim mounts now secured to the differentials, the next logical step is going to be the assembly, painting, and mounting of the main wheels. And you would be correct in that assumption, but pump your brakes a bit because there's one bit of detailing that I still need to add to the differentials here, which is going to be done first prior to the fun part, which will be the wheels. So let's go ahead and eat our vegetables and get those bits of detailing out of the way now. The last bit of detailing that's blocking my path before I could go ahead and install the wheels involved the fasteners, which on the real units would secure this plate here that holds up the shock absorber. It would sandwich the differential to the leaf springs. Now, if you look on the leaf springs, there are the, the U shackle mounts that are integrally printed on. And originally there were fastener and, and rod details that were integrally printed to the differentials. But during the rebuild process, these were not going to be salvageable for one reason or another. And if we can recall the one in the back, the entire plate system needs to have been removed and, and shifted to a different location altogether. So rather than trying to track down the original pieces that were deleted, I went ahead and fabricated new units to add this missing detailing. And that's what I have here in this cup. In this cup here, I went ahead and soldered several of the fasteners that are going to be used for this detailing. Basically what these are, these are small miniature brass hex bolts that I went ahead and soldered a smaller hex bolt to the top portion. And I also soldered a metal wire to the lower portion. The metal wire is going to connect the threaded section to this portion over here. And the reason for that is because of the length of the fasteners that I have, they're not gonna be long enough to fully make it to the bottom portion. So that's why the metal section is gonna act a bit of a bridge. On the top portion, we do have the nuts, but on the a regular hex nut, if I take this guy here and slide him in, You'll see that the hex nut is present on the top, but on the real unit, this would have been, of course, a threaded rod, which would have came out past this plate. And then two hex nuts would have been used to tighten this plate and keep it in place. On the new unit here that I fabricated, you can see that by soldering the smaller bolt to the top of the longer bolt, this gives you the illusion of the two fasteners that are held in place. From here, the fasteners are going to be painted, weathered, and then they're going to be just dropped and mounted directly in the locations that are pre-drilled out on these plates here on the differential. Well, with the lower hull now fully painted and weathered and with the differential now permanently affixed to the model, the next logical step is going to be the road wheels. And this was a portion of the video that I was eagerly awaiting to get to. Like I was alluding to earlier with the tires when I showed them in a preview, the tire components are all strewn out here on the table and are comprised entirely of 3D printed components. The materials, however, are where these differ from the other parts. The other parts are made in one flavor of another of a nylon or some other rigid type plastic, while the tires here, I went with a TPU material. The TPU is used on the tires because TPU is a flexible type medium and for the use of a tire here is a logical choice. Now here we have three tires strewn out on the table. The first are the raw printings. The second tire here, the printings have been assembled. And the final variant right here is the tire after it went through a slight little modification step in order to enhance the surface detailing on it. But I'll touch upon this in a moment. For the tires themselves, on this model here, I went with the Commando Special pattern of tire. When the V100 armor car was first designed and was actually first put into production and service, the tires that it was originally designed for were your standard military thread tire. These are the type of tire thread patterns that you'd see on Jeeps and trucks and things along those lines. One problem with those tires though is that they worked perfectly fine for basic running however when it came time for amphibious operations those tires didn't have any sort of thread on them so the the vehicles didn't exactly propel too well in the water keep in mind these things don't have any sort of of water jets or other propellers on them as what's seen on other vehicles like the LAV-25 for instance. So on the Commando, in order for you to propel through the water, this is exclusively done through the rotation of the tires. So they went ahead and hit the drawing board to come up with a better solution for the tire 
to help it for its aquatic usage. And the, the design they came up with was this one here. These tires were known as the Commando Special Tires, and the thread patterns on them really just more or less resemble something you would see on a grader or even a tractor of some sort, but these tires did have better propulsion through the water. The In addition to the the thread pattern here, the tires were also very, very thick, and this was designed specifically for use to be, well, bulletproof. Obviously, pneumatic tires on a vehicle that's meant to be shot at is something that is a concern. So the tires that are found on the Commando Special were very, very rugged and were able to take basically most calibers of small arms. With the brief history lesson out of the way, this now brings us back to the parts here at hand. The components that you see on this table are going to be listed on the EastCoastArmory.com catalog where I'm going to have a whole page just for the Cadillac Gauge V100. Now I am going to be talking more about that towards the end of this video, so you might want to stay tuned for that. The wheels are going to come in a set and they're going to come in the unassembled format here. Now because of the way the tires are printed, they are comprised of two halves. Part A and Part B. Now, the halves are indexed together via these three little holes that we have on each end. Also supplied with the sets are going to be these 3D printed pegs, which are going to be used to line up the two halves together, so that when you glue them together, you don't have any mishaps where the pieces are in this, albeit interesting, thread pattern here, but would be inaccurate. This is the way they properly line up when the pieces are properly assembled. With the way the holes are lined up on the bottom, or on, I should say on the inside of the two halves, there's only one way that they go together, so this does streamline the assembly of them. But the set gives you more than just the tires. You see, in addition to the tires, you also get the rims and the hubcaps. Both of these components here are also 3D printed. However, you notice that the material on the hubcaps differ from the ones on the rim. The material that I have here is the same material that was utilized on the differentials, and for this application, it should be more than suffice. I was thinking about offering this in the same material as the white nylon over here. However, this would have propelled the cost far in excess of what most people would consider to be appropriate. So, and also in addition to that, from what I've seen from working with these on hand, this material here is more than suffice for the application at hand. The ring is comprised of two pieces. We have the main rim body, as well as the rear ring that we have here. The unit just slides directly into place, locking the rubber tire to the rim in a seamless manner. Here I have a sample unit where you get to see exactly how the system goes together. Now on this one here, I did do a little bit of polishing on the surface texture of the rim, and I'm going to be touching upon that momentarily. But before I can do that, the first thing I want to do is get these halves over here fully assembled. Like I said before, this, this one here is fresh from the printer. This one here is glued together, and is now one piece. And this one here has had an extra step added to it in order to improve the overall look of the wheel itself. To assemble the tire, this is done in a pretty straightforward manner. First I need to do is glue the pegs into their corresponding locations. Now these pegs were mentioned before and are going to be supplied with the sets. The ones on this model here are printed on my own 3D printer. However, this may or may not change when the actual production units are offered. In order to glue the halves together, I utilize tire glue here. This is glue that's sold for RC cars in order to adhere rubber tires to their rims. And it also does a pretty good job securing TPU to TPU from what I've seen. Other tools of the trade are going to be a hammer and as well as three of these large clamps that we have here. We'll see exactly how the clamps are used once the assembly goes, but you need a minimum of three in order to assemble one tire. Once you have the pegs fitted to their locations, it's now time to secure the two halves together. But before you do, it's great to go ahead and dry fit the pieces to make sure that the 
pegs line up on their corresponding holes in the correct way so that when the glue comes into the picture, you, you're not fiddling around trying to find where that sweet spot is and you instantly know where the parts need to go so you get the correct lineup like you're seeing here. Once you have all that ironed out, it's then time to add the adhesive. You want to put a good amount, but not, you know, a whole lot on there. Just be, you know, reasonable with your glue application. All right, that should be enough. Kind of had a quick little accent over here when I was filling in the holes, but it doesn't matter. Once everything gets clamped together, it should be fine. Okay, so now I have my halves. Now I just have to line them up accordingly. Once you do, the wheel should just click together like the way you're seeing it here. Now, a good little thwack or some taps with the hammer or rubber mallet should be helpful in, in getting the piece seated in place. Another trick that, that you're going to need to do is utilize the clamps like I mentioned before. See, the clamps are going to really hold everything together during the period where the glues are setting. And like I said before, this is why you need three. So just line them up around an even spacing, I guess. And just tighten them together and you should be good to go. If you do have some glue that puddles out, just wipe it off with your finger or with a rag or some sort. We'll just make for a cleaner build. Well, there we have it. At this point here, we're just going to set the tire aside, let the super glue set fully, and then we could move on to the next step. I can now get to the other mod that I'm going to be making to these tires. Here we have a tire that has its two halves glued together and fresh out of the clamps like that I just showed before. Now let's compare and contrast that with this tire here that had an extra step done to it. Note the surface texture found on the, the unit over here. Keep in mind this is 3D printed so you surface lines are going to be found on these items. The faces do look pretty good and there's some marks found on this side over here. It's not terrible, but it's, you know, on average what to expect with this material. Now let's compare that to this tire that has a little extra step done to it. You can see that the lines are much more blended in. And the tire's coloring, by the way, is also slightly different. Straight TPU and modified. Now normally to address the surface texturing, I would take some super glue or a similar type of adhesive, apply it to the surface, and then polish it away with some sandpaper. And this technique by and large works pretty well. In fact, I utilize this exact same technique on some of the differential parts that were mentioned in the previous project update video. However, for the tires here, that's not really going to be feasible because like I mentioned before, the tires are a semi-flexible material and adding the super glue to the surface is really just not beneficial. So one technique that I found in order to address this involves this can over here, which is consisting of nothing more than Plasti Dip. Now for anyone who's unaware or who aren't into those ridiculous looking stupid ricer cars, Plasti Dip is this rubber coating material which was originally developed for making replacement tool handles on things like pliers, screwdrivers, and other applications like that. Well, in recent years, Plasti Dip went ahead and turned their dippable material into a spray. And they come in a multitude of colors and can be found just about any hardware store. Well, one thing I was playing around with was the idea of using this as a coating for the 3D printed tire. And needless to say, I think it came out pretty well. The material just sprays on pretty easily. And once it's fully dries, it seems to be a pretty durable surface. Now, 
I can't vouch for the durability of this on something that's radio controlled. However, for a static model like this build is over here, the plastic tip surface is going to be perfectly suffice. So far, even with just light handling, specifically with this tire, which has been bouncing around the shop now for a couple months, I haven't noticed any problems with the corners chipping up or anything. So, so far it seems to be holding up pretty well. And also it has a nice, good matte rubbery color to it, which again, just makes it super more accurate compared to the original TPU material. Now, normally on these builds, I would you know, pr probably have to paint this material and weather it accordingly, but why do that when you can have the real McCoy showing on the surface? So now that I have these two units here that have been done, I'm gonna take you through the motion, how I actually pulled it off, and I'm going to add the coatings to this tire right over here. Well, here we go, I'm outdoors. I'm going to go ahead and apply the paint, or the coating, I should say. Regrettably, it's a bit late in the day, but I should have enough sunlight on hand in order to put the first coat on. Now, of course, this is a aerosol material, so you want to take the appropriate safety measures. You don't want to breathe the stuff in, you want to wear a good respirator, and you don't want to spray it in a location that's, you know, downwind from kids or anything. So, with all that obligatory safety stuff out of the way, I can now talk about the material itself. To Placidip's credit, the stuff applies very easily and pretty effortlessly, and also to their credit, the stuff dries in a very thin coating. So even when you're applying it, it's going to look pretty bulbous in its overall texturing, but after an hour or two, once the stuff finally sets, it's going to be much thinner. Now this is great for Placidip because, you know, you can apply it on surfaces and it'll blend in evenly. However, for this type of an application here, you kind of want some bulbous layers in order to smooth everything out. I found it's going to take about two, possibly three, maybe even four coats of the Placidip in order to give it its final texturing that is more appropriate for this type of a subject matter. Now for the actual coating application, there's more than enough material in one can to, to accomplish one wheel. I found that it takes about three quarters of a can to thoroughly coat all of the surfaces found on these wheels. So if you're doing a procedure like this, just pick up four cans and you'll have enough to do one vehicle. All right, to apply the coating, make sure that the can is thoroughly shaken up. Make sure that the head is clean. Once you have a nice confirmation that the spray's ready to roll, it's time to add the coating. You want to apply it in a nice, even manner. The broad sections are fairly easy to get to. Now, you don't want to put too much on the surface where it starts to drip. So you want to use your head and basically just keep attention to the thickness of the coating just to avoid that from happening. Once you have a nice, sufficient coating on it, it's then time to work on the face. Now, because of the threads, there's going to be a lot of nooks and crannies to get it around. So it's best to just go around several times in different angles in order to get in all of the little spots. A Lazy Susan would probably pr be pretty handy for this, but the getaway of just rotating a pizza box works just as well. And that's it. That's one coat out of the way. Let me go ahead and take the camera off the tripod to show what the surface looks like, in order so you get a good idea, specifically with this lighting situation that I'm working with here. Note that the surface is thoroughly coated. Those little print lines are completely blended away. Same can also be said on the face of the tire. However, like I said, looks are deceiving because once this material fully sets, it's going to be much thinner in its overall look than the way you see it here, and those lines are going to come back. This is why it's going to take about three to four coats of this exact same material in the same format that you just saw in order to fully get it coated to the way you've seen it in the other samples found in the video. From here, now it's just time to play the waiting game. Once it's fully set, of course, I'm going to flip it over and do the same technique to the opposite side, and then just rinse, wash, and repeat. From the tires, this now brings us to more depth to the rims. Here we have a raw printing, 
compared to the one that was showcased earlier that was fitted to the wheel. Note the surface texturing found on the raw printing. There is some surface texturing there. However, the unit by and large is pretty good for the medium. This one here has been improved and I'm gonna show you exactly how to improve this from one of these raw printings. However, to do so, you are gonna need some tooling in order to accomplish this. Let me cut across and I'll show you exactly what I mean. With the rim now secured to the jaws of this chuck here, obviously I'm gonna be utilizing the lathe for this procedure. The lathe is really your best way to pull this polishing procedure off. You can try doing it by hand. It is going, it is possible, but it's probably gonna take you a little bit longer and plus a little bit more elbow grease in order to accomplish. The lathe spins at an even rate and allows you to quickly and mostly effortlessly just polish down the surfaces that are required. Now for this, I'm not going to utilize the super glue technique that I mentioned before. I just didn't see it necessary for this unit over here, but if you wanna try using the super glue sanding method, that is definitely something that can be done. And it's one that will probably give you the same results in the end. But for this one here, I'm just gonna go in with the sandpaper and just polish away the surfaces that are necessary. To do the actual sanding, I'm gonna be utilizing 320 grit sandpaper and I am going to be using the wet sanding method where I take the sandpaper, dip it in some water and just go over the surfaces. Because the cutting tools are obviously not going to be necessary, I'm gonna move the tail stocks out of the way. Hopefully it shouldn't inhibit the view of the camera. Nope, nice and clear. All right, excellent. Let me go ahead, get the sandpaper nice and doused and start the procedure. Obviously this technique is one that should only be done for a person that has the experience on hand to accomplish this procedure. Well, after about five minutes of sanding, here you get to see the results of the polishing on the surface. Note how much smoother the surface is compared to the way it was originally fresh from the printer. After a coat of primer, as well as the base coat, this part here is more than suffice for the application at hand. There is a little bit of goo found on some of the recesses here on the rim, but this is just left over from the sanding procedure and will easily just wash off after a quick rinse in the sink. Now, like you saw with the sanding, these areas here didn't really need to have been altered in any way. I primarily focused my efforts on the face here where the lug nuts are going to protrude, the cone section that's found on the inside, as well as a little bit here found on the inner rim. Well, after a few coats, and that's actually an understatement, a bunch of coats later, here go the wheels now, ready for their next step. You can see how much the texturing has now been diminished on each of these pieces. And again, the color has now changed to a color that better represents like a real rubber tire. Not only did I finish off the two wheels from before, but I also gave the other two wheels some more coats to just really just to finish off the can. One thing I noticed about the plastic dip is that it's kind of like that expandable foam stuff where once you crack that can open, it just is just beneficial to burn through the whole thing. So rather than having it sit around, I might as well give the other wheels some more coats because you know, why not? Well, from here, the wheels can, or I should say the tires can go to the next step where they're getting ready for their hubs, or I should say the rim installation. Now, the pieces are designed so that they fit into each other and this was done specifically like that in CAD. However, in practice, the tolerances are on the very tight end. So in order to have the pieces fit on better, I'm gonna go ahead and just remove a little bit of material on the inside here of all of these tires. And I'll walk you through that in a minute. Uh, normally they do fit on, again, in a snug manner, but with the addition of the paints and the plastic dip, it adds extra layers and it makes the insertion of the parts a little bit more difficult. And with the tire set relocated to the area where I'm going to be doing the hand fitting process, I might as well show the rims now that they have been primed, painted, and weathered. Here you can see how the pieces look. Note these are the exact same components from before. 
and you'll notice that the texturing on them is very, very smooth to the point where, unless I pointed out, you have never would have guessed that these were those 3D printed components from before. Like I stated, the only smoothing that I've done was just to the belt area over here. The other areas are, again, just left untouched, and I just let the paints and the primers just do the rest of the smoothing process. The inner rim sections have also been painted. Now again, due to the amount of paint that are built up on these sections over here, I'm probably going to remove a little bit of material either from here or from the inner ring sections over here on these sides, just so that the pieces can fit on in a more streamlined manner. In order to hand fit the rims to slide on better onto the main row wheels, I'm going to be utilizing this very large sanding drum that we have here. These are found in hardware stores or realistically these days you could find them on Amazon without any problems. It is literally nothing more than a big ass version of the sanding drums that are found on the Dremel. So this unit just gets mounted directly into my drill press that we have here and I'm just going to go ahead and just turn it on and move along on the inside here in a very methodical manner, which will just open up the tolerances to the point where this, the rim will slip right in. Now with the way the pieces are designed, it shouldn't be that much material that needs to be removed in order to free up the tolerances for the piece to slide on. Of course, having said that though, you do want to take care or pay attention so that you're carefully removing an even amount of material over the entire center portion here, because obviously if you chew out more material from one side than the other, it's going to leave for the piece being mounted in an oblong manner. So that's just something you want to pay attention to. With that out of the way, After a few passes, the hub, or I should say the rim, keep getting those two words confused, slides directly in place. Ah, there we go. It's on so tight that no adhesives are going to be needed any further. All I gotta do is now slip on the rear ring here, and this row wheel, well, it's basically ready for installation. Well, there you go. This The rim just slid directly in place. Now, because of the sanding procedure, I did lose the paint that was found on the inner portion here, so there's a little bit of that that is visible. However, this will be addressed with a paintbrush with some touch-up paint, and then once I weather everything in, we'll just blend in as it does on the remainder of the rim. Now, the tire itself will be getting some extra weathering on it. However, this is done towards the tail end of the build when the build is basically going through its final paces. And obviously, after the rims are secured to the tires, it's now time to mount them to the model. You'll notice that I have three of the four wheels that are fitted. And by the way, it's so far, it's looking really awesome. And here we have the last one now. The unit was just slid directly in place as you would on, you know, your car in your garage. The holes line up perfectly, or just about perfectly, with the rims. During the fitting process, I did go ahead with a eighth of an inch drill bit and I went through all of these locations here just to remove any sort of paint debris that built up in those locations, you know, from the painting procedure. But once those areas were loosened up, the wheels just slid right in. Getting the wheels on can be a little tricky because remember the hub does rotate so you have to index it properly and make sure when you're, in, you're mounting it on you don't accidentally nudge it and rotate it and that's really the only problems but in the grand scheme of things that's really not much of an issue. So now that the 
the rim and the tire is secured in place, it's now time to, well, secure more permanently to the main differential. And that's done, well, with actual lug nuts, or in this case, M3 fasteners. Like what was mentioned before, the drum itself has threaded rods that are emerging from the inside unit. So, again, you just slip on the wheel, and at this point here, no different than, say, your average car. You just go ahead, find that sweet spot on the fastener, and just rotate the nuts in place. Now, no, I know what you're probably thinking, or some of you who live in bad neighborhoods are probably thinking, no, I do not have any of those security lug nuts, the ones that have that weird star pattern on them. But then again, I'm not exactly planning to park my V100 outside of Detroit, so... Should be okay. For the lug nuts right now, I'm only going to put four of them on at this time, because it's really just a temporary bond, or I should say, a temporary mounting at this portion of the build. As the build progresses, or I should say, as the vehicle comes to its end, I'm going to remove the wheels so, in order so I could get the entire upper section of the hull in a more thorough coat of paint. So, for now, this is just testing purposes. Do, do, do. All right. Oh, there it is. The wheels are now secured to the model. Now, you'll notice that on the center hub section over here, there is no detailing currently present. Well, like we recall before, that detailing is facilitated by this runner here. And the way this is designed is that this will be glued to the rim itself, covering up that hole and giving you the much needed detailing for the actual hubcap. However, though this is done, again, at the tail end of the build, when the wheels are going to be mounted to their differentials in a permanent manner. For now, though, I can just set this aside and put it with the other parts that I have on hand for this vehicle. And, well, let me go ahead and take the camera around so you get to see now what the vehicle looks like that it has wheels. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all. It is really starting to take shape now. Here you can see the wheels rotating. Note they spin nice and smooth because of that design that I mentioned before. And, well, that basically wraps up the wheels. But there's one more thing that I need to do, and you know what? It's long overdue for this partially started haul. Well, here we have it. This is a huge milestone on this project now. After all those hours of measuring and planning, cutting, designing, re redesigning, altering, well, all of that comes to the conclusion to what you see right here. This is a huge monumental step. Now, for anyone who's into scratch building or looking to get into scratch building once at scale models, the suspension is a extremely crucial portion of the build because, you know, when it, the vehicle's sitting upside down on your table, like a dead bug, you know, you can pump a lot of resources into the design as well as the detailing, and that's all fine and dandy. However, that really doesn't mean anything if the suspension just doesn't hold up. If you put the model right side up and it goes and cracks on you, basically you need to hit the drawing board again. As we can see right here though, that is definitely not going to be the case. With the camera off the tripod, here you get to see the model now in better light. Starting with the vehicle's height, it this vehicle does have a very high stance to it, which is something that is seen on the real examples that I've seen in person as well as also from my research. The V100 itself has a really muscular, very rugged and robust type appearance to it, and so far, all the puzzle pieces seem to be lining up appropriately. Once it's confirmed that the suspension can physically hold up the weight of the model, the next important element to factor in or to be aware of is the levelness of the model once it's sitting on its suspension. For anyone who was keeping tabs on this build and watching the previous videos, you'll know that during the design portion or the assembly portion where I was planning and installing all these components down here, I took a lot of precautions and I methodically showed exactly how everything gets mounted in a nice square way. If we recall from those videos, I 
double checked everything with squares, bubble levels, just to make sure everything was on an even keel. And here is the end result of that. If I go ahead and take my bubble level and put it on top of the hull now, boom, the bubble is dead center right here on the top portion of the hull. And I also want to test it from the other direction. If I move the camera and it's equally square when testing it for the alignment height going sideways. Because this vehicle here has a static suspension system, obviously this simplifies immensely the rest of the vehicle's production. And I'm not gonna have to worry about those other factors that I mentioned before. One last thing I wanna point out before I take the model and put it back up on the table is this is really the first time I've been able to pick up the model with its suspension fitted and the model's weight is a feather. This thing is a fraction of the weight compared to the other 1.6 scale models that I've built in the past. If I was to put a weight on this, I'd say it's definitely a little over 15 pounds, which is a feather in terms of 1.6 scale models. Now, I'm pretty sure someone watching this is going to be like, John, 15 pounds for a model? That's absurd. What are you talking about? That's nuts. Well, normally, possibly, but in terms of a 1.6 scale model, that's nothing. I often tell people that ask me about these models' weight, and I usually say the following phrase, which is, if you're building something a 1.6 scale and it's not heavy, you're doing it wrong. These models, just with the nature of them, lends itself to weight. This has to do, of course, with the overall size, the weight of the materials, and specifically when you add the detail components, it just makes the model's weight increase. If I was to take a guess, I believe that the heaviest things on this model at this point are the tires. These tires are 3D printed, but they are printed hollow. On the inside, there's a honeycomb type system, which gives you nice structural strength, but uses less material and also speeds up the time for production. If these were made the old fashioned way, these would have been solid cast rubber and would have been much heavier compared to the final outcome you see right here. Needless to say, with the suspension components mounted to this model, this is a huge portion of the build that's now basically completed. With the suspension chapter almost closed, the remainder of the build is primarily going to involve just fleshing out the, the other areas that are found on the surface portions of the hull. I'd say the next challenging aspect of the build is going to involve the designing of the hatches, which are found on both sides of the model as well as on the rear, where these units, I'm looking to make them fully functional as well as having interior detailing on them. As challenging as those are going to be, compared to the differentials, the leaf springs, the tires, the rims, and not to mention the shock absorbers, as well as all the other hull mods that I've done at this point here, in the great scheme of things, they're probably going to be much simpler. You see, although the suspension is mounted to this model, it's not technically completed yet. There's still one bit of detailing that still needs to be added to this inner wheel well section that we have right here. Like what was mentioned in a earlier video, there's this detail insert that's used to accommodate the fittings for the clevis and linkage system, which connects the hull to the steering mechanism on the front differential. These components here are still in design and will be mounted and completed in the next video update, so it's gonna be something to look forward to. Before I close out of this video, I wanna point out that by the time this video drops, I should have the 1.6 scale V100 parts catalog page live on the eastcoastarmory.com website. There, all of the parts that are ready for production are going to be listed, available for order. And just like I do on all of my other videos, once new parts are available and are released on the catalog, I will be sure to mention them in these project update videos. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for this scratch built 1.6 scale Cadillac gauge M706 armor car. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 1.6 scale project update videos like this fellow over here, or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted since the project start and have been continuously updated as the build progresses, not to mention the other smaller and larger scale builds that are showcased on this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time. See you guys later.